there's one gap in the polling data that's bigger than we've ever seen before, which is if you ask people how is the economy, they say awful. And yet, if you ask them individually, how is your situation, they're saying it's pretty good. Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer. And today we talk all things inflation. From the price of bacon to the cost of housing, everything but the stock market is going up. We're all feeling it, some a lot more than others. At the same time, unemployment remains very low. And thanks to months spent at home during the pandemic, many Americans have a bigger savings cushion to fight against high prices. But as prices continue to hit 40 year highs, 65% of registered voters believe the US economy is heading towards recession. So why is it happening? And is there anything that can be done to make it stop? This week, I speak with American economist, Austin Goolsbee. And then Russia's war in Ukraine has led to an increase in one kind of petty crime in America. What did you just do? But first, I represent the rent that's too damn high party. My main job is to provide a roof over your head, food on the table, and money in your pocket. I love that guy, and he has a point. But Jimmy McMillan says he has stepped away from politics after several unsuccessful bids for the mayoral and gubernatorial seats in New York. Sure, his platform was lacking on substance on, well, pretty much on everything. But he's right, the rent is too damn high especially in 2022. The average rent in Manhattan hit a record $5,000 a month in June. Landlords in the country's largest rental market are trying to recoup lost expenses from the pandemic and national rents are up about 16% year over year. These numbers make a difference in calculating just how bad the country's rising prices have gotten. Inflation has hit a 40-year high in the United States. The price of gas, housing, and food has surged 9.1% since June of 2021. And like most economic crises, lower-income workers, and particularly Black and Latino Americans, have all been hit the hardest. The economy has been overheating, and that means until recently, growth has been high and consumer prices have gone up. And the Federal Reserve, the Fed, is trying to do its best to bring those prices down without causing recession. How do they do that? Well, by raising interest rates, borrowing money becomes more expensive to consumers, they in turn spend less. Demand falls and inflation, ideally, this is the theory, starts to drop. But the Fed has already raised rates four times in 2022, and we're likely looking at another raise in September. Not at all clear whether this strategy will work. Well-known economist, we've had him on the show, Larry Summers says that in order to get inflation under control, we're gonna have to raise unemployment. But that comes with a serious cost, with pain and suffering for the Americans who can least afford it. And these are only the issues in the United States. Europe's largest war since World War II has sent energy prices skyrocketing globally and it's forcing the European Central Bank to raise rates for the first time in over a decade. In Turkey, food prices have doubled, inflation at nearly 80%. The world's most vulnerable in developing countries are suffering the most as the rising price of fertilizer, wheat, and fuel have made it harder to put food on the table. So what is it going to take to climb out of this hole? This week, I speak with Austin Goolsbee. He's professor of economics at the University of Chicago, and he's former chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisors under President Obama. Here's our conversation. Austin Goolsbee, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, great to see you again. Now, a lot of people were very critical of the policy response the last time we had a massive recession, 2008, 2009, in part because they said we were taking care of the rich people and we didn't really care about the average American. Um, no one can say that about this crisis, right? You know, Ian, I, I was there for, for the stimulus in 2009, and the critique of the policy in 2009 and dealing with the financial crisis, of course, was 
it, they wished it were bigger. And coming out of the Bush administration, people wished it wasn't primarily geared toward financial institutions. So you could almost feel that in the response of the CARES Act under Trump and the and the rescue plan under Biden, that they weren't going to make the mistake of it being too small They make it as big as it could possibly be. And they'll spread it around so it doesn't just go to banks. They're going to be checks to people. We're going to help the unemployed. We're going to help the airline industry, the cruise ship industry. We're going to help all small business. We're going to have the Fed engage and unlock massive amounts of lending. Looking back, for sure, given that the recovery was as fast as it was, you would not do as big of a, a rescue amounts as we did the five, you know, we did five trillion in the CARES Act and another two trillion in the rescue plan. Um, and the, not to mention there were there are some others as they go along. And that's the biggest yeah. spend that we've ever had, uh, you know, bigger than all the wars except World War II combined. Uh, so I think the magnitude you would you would probably do smaller. Now, why do you think today with unemployment as low as it is? I mean, I understand that inflation upsets people, but is is that uh, solely the reason why people seem so incredibly negative about their economic estimates going forward, no matter who you talk to? Look, the thing is, the polling data, th there's one gap in the polling data that's bigger than we've ever seen before, which is if you ask people how is the economy, they say awful, like as bad as they've ever said the economy was, even worse than during the Great Recession. And yet, if you ask them individually, how is your situation, how is your bank account, they're saying it's pretty good. And, and that's because, as, as you highlighted, the unemployment rate is extremely low. They're upset that wages for a lot of people have not kept up with inflation. But overall, the difference between how they say the economy is doing and how they say their personal finances are doing has never been bigger. Um, so, so then we got to try to figure out why is that? What do you think is going to be sticky in terms of changes in how we think about the global economy on the back of the pandemic? My view is if something was a trend for 50 or 100 years before COVID and we see a dramatic reversal for two years in an extremely unusual period, I think it's overwhelmingly likely we're going to go back to what it was before because there were some important factors driving it that. We should be making all of this lower lower end stuff at home in the case of an emergency like this, you want to be able to have your own masks and have your own vaccines and have your own baby formula, have your own socks, whatever it is. I think that will end up being a blip, even though that's now an overwhelming trend. I think the fact that 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 forgets how we got to the lean production system and globalized supply chain we had before COVID, and that is they're big economies of scale and it's cheaper. And as I say, what's going to happen is two years, four years, sometime from now, somebody's going to wake up and they're going to look out the window and they're going to say, why do we have a giant warehouse full of socks that we made here that we could buy on the open market for one third the price and we can just have shipped here when we need them? Why, why do we have this warehouse? And at that moment, kind of the legacy of the pandemic will, will be forgotten. Speaking of blips, I mean, for decades before the pandemic, labor had less and less influence with capital uh, and in the political system. Um, that obviously is changing now. Um, and everybody wants to work more flexibly. People don't want to be in the office. They can demand a lot more. Is that also a blip? I kind of am afraid that a lot of that is a blip, uh, that right now workers have a almost unprecedented level of bargaining power where, as one CEO described it, the, the only question is, do you want your popcorn buttered or salted? So the thing, the thing that I think we're going to have to see is if you look 
in the period from, let's say, 1970 to 2020. Over that 50-year period, we had a lot of productivity growth and pay did not match it. So the theory says that people's pay should be tr should track productivity. But we had a lot of productivity growth and that split from wages. And, and that's a different way of saying corporate profits as a share of national income rose to unprecedented levels as a kind of a frontline indicator of what's the what's the power, the bargaining power of workers. And right now, workers are demanding and receiving work from home, flexibility, things like that. But now roll the tape forward to a period where it's more like a normal labor market. Forget about, forget about a, a recession like labor market. Let's say we're just in normal times. I think the employers are going to, you know, it's going to be the, the empire is going to strike back and the employers are basically going to say either, no, we demand you come to work. And if you don't want to come into the office, you know, go work somewhere else. Or they're going to say, hey, you've gotten a nice bounty being able to work from home. So we're going to pay you less or we're going to expect you to work more on your own time. So all of those things make me think it's it's not going to be as rosy a scenario as as it seems right now. OK, so, Austin, um, let's get to inflation for a moment. Uh, do you think it is with us uh, for the foreseeable future? And what are the implications of it? It's been longer and louder. Uh, it, it's I, I will highlight it's not just government officials who have made the mistake of thinking inflation was going to go away or be smaller. The market absolutely made this the same mistake. Just look at interest rates. They set interest rates below what the inflation rate ended up being. So the real interest rate was negative. If you took out, if you borrowed money, if you got a mortgage uh, at, at the rates before, you've been doing great. Uh, for this year. I have thought that the answer to the question of what we need to do hinges critically on this second question of, did the inflation come from supply or did it come from demand? If it came from excess stimulus, excess monetary stimulus, excess fiscal stimulus, which there are a lot of economists think it did, then the correct answer is the Fed needs to tighten monetary policy and raise the interest rate and try to cool off demand. And that's kind of the traditional Fed thing to do. They really only have one tool, which is the screwdriver. We can tighten right. it, we can loosen it. And they, they they look at the interest rate sensitive parts of the economy and, and that's what they do. The problem is if the inflation came from supply, if you think war in Ukraine or the labor supply shocks from COVID, or a series of things hitting the supply chain are where the inflation came from. Well, there's another lesson from the 1970s, which is supply shock inflation doesn't go away from just tightening demand. And that what the Fed would do in that case, they could raise the unemployment rate, but they're just gonna generate a stagflation. So I have to ask you the one question. Larry Summers says we have to, you know, let go a whole bunch of people if you want to fix this inflation story. Uh, I take it you do not actually agree with that. I don't. It kind of goes to my thing of you, you got to answer how much of this inflation do you think came from demand or supply? In Larry's mind, I think is the view that this inflation is overwhelmingly from too much demand. And so in that world, he says, you know, we got to raise the unemployment rate to 10% for one year or seven and a half percent for three years. Or he, he, he gave you a whole menu uh, schedule of, of what you could choose. Uh, fundamentally, that's a story of demand. And I think at least 50% of the inflation is not from demand. So what could easily happen if you were going to follow that prescription is you could raise the unemployment rate to seven and a half percent. Millions of people lose their job and then the inflation's not going away because it's not coming from excess demand, in which case you, you probably want to be a little circumspect. I mean, the, 
what it means for the unemployment rate to go to 7.5% is a lot of pain for millions of people. So the next couple of months are actually pretty critical in this entire equation. I think that's true. I think the next couple of months, how fast the Fed and other central banks raise rates and whether you start to see the core inflation begin to come down and make people feel a little like the heat is a little less on them. It's not going to remove the political heat because it's not on an election timetable. So it's not going to be solved by November. But if the new months of inflation started coming in lower because we started to get relief on the supply chain, I, I think that would be one path. If not, if it just kept accelerating, even the new months keep accelerating, then I think the Fed and the central banks are going to have no choice but to raise rates qu quite a lot more. Austin Goolsby, thanks for joining us today. Great to see you. Russia's war in Ukraine has had a big global impact. Rising energy and food costs, supply chain gridlock, refugees fleeing violence. But there's also one surprising impact you might not have expected. You're watching thieves make off with a catalytic converter. The theft took just over a minute and happened during the early morning hours. Palladium is a rare and precious metal, you knew that. And Russia is the largest producer, maybe you didn't know that. They make up 40% of the global supply. It's used in flutes, yes, flutes, at the dentist's office. And you guessed it, it's in your car's catalytic converter. What is a catalytic converter, you ask? Great question. Catalytic converters, or CATs for short, filter toxic compounds from your engine and convert it into something safer, like steam, essentially reducing the pollution that comes out of your tailpipe. But the price of precious metals has skyrocketed after Russia's invasion on February 24th, with palladium hitting an all-time high of $3,440 an ounce in March. Today, the price is closer to $2,000 an ounce, which is still a lot, especially if you're a flautist. The problem has gotten so bad that it's even hit G-Zero's very own Matt Frampton, who does not play flute, but he does own a 2008 Prius, and he parks it on the street in Brooklyn. Matt, tell us what happened. My wife went down to move it one morning and gets in the car, turns on the car, and just hears this god awful sound. Uh, and it just sounds like the car is going to explode. And we had no idea what it was. You know, the guy who came from the towing service knew immediately. I mean, he literally got out of the car and he said, Oh, you've got a Prius. Someone has stolen your catalytic converter. But he didn't even have to look. He knew immediately what it was. Catalytic converter thefts have been on the rise since the beginning of the pandemic. The National Insurance Crime Bureau estimates that more than 52,000 catalytic converters were stolen in 2021. In 2018, that number was just 1,300. State lawmakers are trying to fix the issue and have been working on more than 150 pieces of legislation throughout the country, which is like more than three per state, which seems overdone to me. There's even a congressional bill in the works because apparently the state legislators don't know what they're doing. So, so what's a worried driver to do in the meantime? You can install what's called a cat guard to help deter thieves. Moose approves. Or you could mail your car repair bills to the Kremlin, care of Vladimir Putin. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see, or you just like shacks, you want to talk about shacks, Shack Week coming up. That's right. You know who's got shacks? That's right. G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter. It's called Signal.